All right, in today's lecture, I want to talk about the problem area of ownership management. I will tell you in a second what it is. It's basically about finding owners for software artifacts in any sort of software engineering context. And I will specifically also try to place ownership management in the broader context of mining software repositories. So it might not be like the most obvious problem area in, in the MSR field, but there are interesting relationships that I want to point out. And everything I'm discussing today is also based on a paper that uh, we have written recently uh, while I was still at Facebook. So this is a paper at the International Conference on Program Comprehension uh, 2020, uh, where we specifically uh, wrote about ownership management. Uh, there's also a recorded keynote I gave at the same conference, uh, which covered this and two other uh, related topics more broadly you might also be interested in. All right, so what is ownership management? Um, the simple slogan is here, each asset within a, let's say, software company has the most accountable owner at all times. So obviously we, we like to have an owner, a responsible a person or a team for any given asset and an asset might be something like a source code file of course but also like database tables or pipelines in a, in a big data context or ml models any sort of uh, software or data artifact in a um, in a company right and again um, the owner and that could be a person or that could be a team uh, should be thought of as a point of contact, you see, for all kinds of uh, uh, aspects such as if there is a reliability, a reliability issue, if there's a security or privacy issue, that person, that owner should be the point of contact. And ownership management is about establishing and maintaining a situation that each asset has the most accountable owner at all times. So at Facebook, we have worked on this uh, so-called honesty architecture. This is an architecture that uh, basically supports ownership management and particularly it uh, supports ownership recommendation. That is, you know, for assets that may not be owned or may not be strongly owned, it recommends owners or even for assets that are owned, it might end up recommending better owners because ownership sort of changes over time. Let me just briefly talk you through this architecture here. Um, okay, what we really want is, in the end, we want a meter store, sort of, with ownership information that is always up to date and always has uh, the best owners in there. And the idea is that we generate uh, recommendations that help developers or other engineers to use tooling or also some sort of task or project management to actually change ownership, right? So we have to understand how we generate these recommendations. So the idea is that we might extract features both from the assets themselves, such as source code files or database tables, and also from the logs. I mean, how we use all the systems uh, including administration tools or any sort of system, also version control. So from those things, from the assets themselves, from the logs, we extract features and from that we uh, build feature vectors. And these feature vectors essentially, eventually go into a machine learning system, right? Of course, we also, as we are using supervised um, approach here, we also need some labeling data. So basically some sort of ground truth so that we can uh, train and test the ML model. So the labeling data uh, basically has to come up with cases of uh, definite ownership, if you like, or uh, cases of either acquiring or losing ownership. So, so if someone explicitly, for example, writes into the meter store that the team is owning uh, a certain asset, then on that day, uh, we have a we have a labeling event that you know for this specific day for this specific team and asset we know for sure that uh, this newly um, annotated uh, team is indeed the owner and anything that was 
component before is no longer deep. So by this we also get some ground truths and so we can build a machine learning model and we get the predictions and then there's some, uh, we call it sugar coating going on so that we get explainable recommendations uh, which kind of give really some um, explanation to the user so that they can understand why a certain uh, owner is recommended or perhaps there are multiple options, multiple candidates, and then the explanation should also kind of explain why these options are sorted in a certain way. Okay, so this is sort of the machine learning based architecture um, for an ownership recommendation system. And I mean, in a sense here, how we also extract features from assets. I mean, this, this feels a little bit like mining software repository work, right? Because we continuously um, extract stuff from the assets such as source code files it's a little bit more it's, a, it's broader right because we might also really um, process arbitrary logs not just version control logs but logs of pretty much any tooling that is used in software development but this nicely generalizes what we are doing in basic mining software repository approaches okay um, in this context of ownership management, uh, all kinds of metrics come to mind. So you might wonder uh, how many different asset types there are. Depends on the company and depends on where you draw the line. It's easily dozens, right? Then you might wonder uh, how many assets are there of a given type. Um, so in terms of the experience at Facebook, I can say, you know, you're easily in the range of millions of assets. Um, and this is also why you need some automation. This is why you need machine learning so that you can uh, constantly uh, maintain uh, the best possible owner. Uh, so manual work is just not going to scale here enough. So how many different owner types are there? Well, that's just a few, right? So it, you, you might have a, uh, the individual owner type and you might have the so-called uh, on-call, I mean, kind of team owner type. In fact, there are different kinds of teams that can own things. So it's just a bunch of owner types. And then if you look at the, uh, the owner candidates of a given owner type, uh, well, I mean, basically this is the number of teams or individuals that can possibly own an asset of the given type. But what we quickly try to do by machine learning or otherwise uh, we quickly try to get down to a shorter list of, you know, reasonable, of promising candidates. And that should possibly be maybe per asset, maybe we just want to consider like 10 or maybe 100 um, shortlisted owner candidates. These are promising candidates. So machine learning basically has to figure out how to uh, further prioritize than this, um, this short list. And I mean, it's also interesting to understand um, how assets change over time and also how ownership uh, changes over time, because, you know, this sort of affects the whole problem of ownership management. The idea is if, if an asset changes a lot and maybe those changes involve different parties, that might hint at different owner candidates and actually transfer of ownership. And so, indeed, uh, there are there are you know assets and asset types where you, let's say, over the period of a year, might have two, three, four different owners. Okay. Yeah. So just to um, connect this discussion of ownership management to a mining software repository, uh, let's compare it. Uh, so MSR typically involves mining from software repositories, and if you look at the body of research in this area the notion of software repository is already really broadly understood. It's not just, you know, uh, the mere uh, source code. It might also entail uh, the, the, the uh, bug tracking. It, it might entail any sort of configuration. And so we just push this a little bit farther here in this sort of research in that we really look at locking in a most general way. So we, we need to understand locking all across all development, all tooling. Um, so that, that's maybe how we stretch it here. Now, 
Uh, MSR also typically aims at generalizable insights, so you know the the prototypical, the stereotypical MSR work would would give you some distribution or something, some really general in, in, insight. So we could do this here in the context of ownership management. Uh, so for example, we could ask questions like, what percentage of asset appears to be strongly owned, right? This, this, would, be, this would be an interesting number. If you could say, you know, let's say 70% maybe are strongly owned and the rest is kind of weakly defined, right? Or there's some ambiguity. This would be generally interesting. Uh, or, you know, how much fluctuation of ownership do we have typically over time? You know, like, let's say for a database table, uh, how long is it typically owned, you know, with, with, with the initial owner and when does ownership typically, how long does it take for ownership to uh, uh, get to someone else? Uh, yes, we could, we could ask these questions, we could answer these questions with exactly the kind of uh, technology that we use here, but, and that's where, where things differ in, in this sort of uh, context here, we are not so much interested in these general numbers, they, they would be a byproduct. We're more interested in continuous or online prediction. So we want to continuously uh, recommend owners rather than, you know, just compile statistics or mathematical insights. Okay. Right, so, so you know, in a way, ownership management is a good example of, uh, you know, generalizing uh, information retrieval, machine learning, which we have in common with mining software repositories, generalizing it to software engineering scope, okay? Right, so let's uh, dive a little bit deeper into the honesty style system for ownership prediction or recommendation. Uh, so I just want to give you a bit more insight here. So. I, I was talking about feature extraction that we need to extract features from logs and also from files. Uh, this could, the files could be source code files, and this could also be uh, database schemas, this could even be um, maybe not files but database images, anything. So here let's just look at a few examples that are concerned with uh, feature extraction in the interest of ownership for source code files. So obviously what we would do is we would uh, look at the authors of diffs. I mean, diffs is like Facebook terminology for, let's say, a system change or commit. So we would look at authors of diffs uh, for a file. We would look at reviewers and reviewers might, maybe we, we would say, okay, uh, whoever's commenting on a system change, uh, that, that's one sort of indication. But if someone makes a decision on a, a system change such, such as accepting or rejecting a change, you know, this, this might be a stronger sign of ownership. So, so we, anyways, we get all the signal here. So this is all considered ownership signal. Number of lines change, right? If I change more lines in a file, maybe you have a stronger ownership. Uh, if I, if I comment on more lines, maybe it's a stronger sign of ownership. If I'm involved with the task, with the bugs created around the diff, uh, if I create it, if I close the, 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 the issue, if I comment on the issue or whatever, uh, this might also be an ownership uh, signal. If, if I'm actually importing the file a lot um, in my own code and assuming that we know the owner of some code and so if that code in, imports this file in question here, well, maybe this is also an ownership signal. So this is just a sketch here. Um, in practice, you might end up easily with hundreds of raw features in this way, because we also have to take into account the timeline. Um, so quite easily you end up with hundreds of features here. So this, this gets us to the notion of feature composition. So, you know, what we basically need to do is we need to compile feature vectors that we actually want to use in, in machine learning. Um, so the architecture here works like this. We have, we have all kinds of feature extraction pipelines, kind of big data, data engineering stuff that goes into the log files or that processes the assets. And so we get all kind of uh, um, separate features. And then what we need to do with feature composition is we need to um, compose all these features and compile feature vectors and maybe also add some metadata so that later on we can look at the feature vectors and they are sort of explainable and you know uh, people can understand why the ml system 
has uh, made a certain recommendation. Also, eventually, somewhere in this process, we need to enable feature selection. So, you know, initially, we might start with all the features we have, and then we, uh, then we um, find out about feature importance later, and then we optimize the system by doing, by only uh, um, using certain uh, uh, features, not all of them. All right. And then eventually we need to uh, build a uh, machine learning system. So we might use things like decision trees uh, or uh, logistic regression and uh, possibly other uh, approaches. So in the end, the predictions we, we expect from the ML system is that uh, basically a table like this here. So, so let's say we have an asset F1, some file F1. Uh, we kind of expect probabilistic uh, recommendations for this asset in terms of what possible owners come to mind. So these are different owner candidates here, O, A, B, C, D. And the system would come back with different probabilities uh, in terms of what the system thinks, uh, what the right owner is. And of course, based on the meta store that I was showing earlier, we might have a notion of a current owner. So, so for example, here it turns out currently, uh, according to the meta store, OB would be the current owner, but you see the system actually ranks this owner uh, um, somewhat lower. So there's a different owner, OA, uh, with, with a much higher probability. So what, what this means here is probably we are looking at a case where uh, file F1, uh, where we should transfer the ownership from OB to OA. And by the way, we also have a column here with label. This is the, this is the ground truth related label. Uh, in this case, I made it all null, which means uh, this particular asset here and those candidates uh, on a given day uh, are not involved in, 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 in contributing ground truths. So this is this is pure prediction here. So we don't have any, we, we are not looking at any ground truths here. Okay, just to give an idea. All right, so then, then ultimately we turn these predictions into explainable recommendations. So this is, uh, this is sort of a standard issue in machine learning as you might know. Uh, so, so we usually talk about what's called interpretable models and I mean, interpretable models are, are great because uh, they are more easily consumed by humans in, in terms of that they know uh, how the system uh, has arrived at a certain decision. So for example, if you just use plain decision trees with a limited depth, then, uh, well, they are quite naturally interpreted because I can just look at the, uh, at the uh, few, at a, at a short pass in the decision tree. And if this doesn't work, because maybe decision trees and limiting the depth is, is uh, not giving you a good ML model with good performance, well, then you might end up doing something like uh, limiting yourself to ex at least explanation of the individual predictions. So this is usually possible, for example, for all decision tree algorithms on the grounds of, let's say, um, um, feature importance, right? Yes, so, and then if you use something like a black box model, which is inherently not ex interpretable, uh, maybe use uh, de deep learning or such, um, yes, then you, you can still recover some degree of uh, explainability by using what's called counterfactuals. I, I gave you an example here. So basically, you can play with the model by just changing features a little bit and see whether uh, this drastically changes the prediction, such as, you know, had you touched the file in the last two days, you would have been recommended as owner. I mean, compared to all the other candidates that, that are in scope, right? So this also would give you some, some level of explainability. All right, and then these explainable recommendations, they indeed need to be uh, fed into tooling or some sort of task or project management, because we somehow need to act on these recommendations. Uh, maybe if you, high, if you have high confidence uh, recommendations, they can be automatically realized. You know, the meter store may be changed pretty much automatically to uh, 
take care of the new owner. In many cases, maybe uh, a human should be in a loop to confirm or to possibly reject uh, some owner recommendation. So typical actions here are that uh, that someone on the grounds of a recommendation claims ownership of an unknown assets uh, or someone really says, okay, no, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm no longer the owner, so please ownership management take care of this. Or if, if you are facing um, uh, ownership recommendation towards you, uh, you might say, uh, no, no, I, I need to escalate this. I'm definitely not the owner. Uh, I, 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 you know, I contact director, maybe he's aware of the right team in this business unit, okay? And also you might just go and say, well, I'm, I'm not the owner, but I actually figured out uh, who the owner is and so th these sort of actions are possible here right and there's there's lots of challenges in ownership management uh, overall uh, let me just quickly go through some of them uh, overall you know obviously even if you knew all the owners of all your assets at a given point in time there is fundamentally this ownership decay right um, so I, I change my work profile, I change teams, etc. So um, basically, or maybe I'm, I'm not taking good care of the assets. So, th so this is what I mean by ownership decay, right? Um, so there's also the issue if you, if you have like uh, any sort of asset type, let's say some sort of uh, database table, uh, let's say somewhere in a data warehouse, uh, it might not be a clever idea to treat all the instances of that asset type in the same way. So usually, uh, based on workflows or other um, kind of classifiers, uh, it, it's quite possible that you know the asset type has actually many different subtypes and they should all be treated differently. So figuring this out is also a challenge. Now, team level ownership is also a challenge because usually uh, for example, Facebook, it's not like individuals really own the assets because that doesn't make sense uh, because you need to be available for, for alerts, for, for any sort of incidents. And so ownership bet better goes with the team level. But the problem is um, teams as such don't interact with assets. Uh, it's always the individual that interacts with assets. So all the signal about ownership comes from the individual whereas you read, really need ownership at a team level. And that, that's also a challenge in, in terms of how you actually uh, implement such a system. Yes. Um, and then ultimately the problem of ownership management boils down to, to the ranking. Uh, I mean, usually it's not too hard to define a relatively short listed, but still too long list of, of candidates but what it really boils down is then ranking those candidates. Okay, that's, that's maybe at the heart of the problem. And then there's also the issue that many assets kind of uh, have a whole part kind of nature. So the, uh, I mean, the simple case would be a folder consisting of many files, right? But there are uh, more subtle examples. And so, which means that ownership should also respect this whole part relationship somehow. Um, Another interesting issue is that the features that we typically have here, they are all concerned with interaction in a sense or ownership signal. And they should all be such that um, if, if we have more of the signal, uh, it should also translate into uh, more likely the owner, right? So, so this is what I mean by monotonic features. So this somehow limits the, the style of ML system that you need to build here. And ultimately, I was talking a little bit about explainable recommendations. So it's not enough just to create probabilities of owners and candidates, you know, being associated. You really need to convince humans that the recommendations make sense and therefore they need to be explainable. All right, um, let me skip some details here. Um, uh, but let me just point out a few areas of related work. Um, just to see how this connects to software engineering and to some extent also to mine software repositories more directly. So for example, um, the rear of ownership recommendation also really re uh, relates to an established area of what's called review recommendation. 
So this is a common problem in, let's say, in a normal Git or uh, Git workflow, right? That if you have a pull request, um, then you know someone should be assigned as the reviewer, and so this is this is a similar recommendation system. It's not it's not exactly about ownership. It's more about uh, someone being able, someone being uh, the right person to review something. But obviously, it's, it's very much related. There's lots of related work on this. Or there's also this second uh, theme here, code authorship attribution. This sounds very much like ownership, right? I mean, we also want to basically attribute uh, authors to, to, let's say, source code files. But actually, the way it's meant here, and this is a broad area, is more related to plagiarism and malware detection, right? So if you, if you have a certain kind of source code, you want to be able to see that this has been written maybe by this person or that this is very similar to in style or otherwise in terms of watermarks to, to, to some other uh, code that you already know which, uh, which you can use in order to detect that some plagiarism has happened or that you have uh, instance of malware. So obviously, you know, it's not quite the same as our kind of ownership where we are rather concerned with using ownership signal that comes from the broader development process, engineering process, okay. Um, yeah, and then I also mentioned here, uh, change impact analysis, that's also somewhat interesting, right? Change impact analysis is basically about a problem to understand how change over here impacts uh, the system more broadly. And there is some interesting relations to ownership management uh, because that sort of dependency um, is also relevant to ownership. I mean, very simple example, I was mentioning this before. If I use some piece of code a lot, and it's maybe just me using this piece of code a lot, then I actually sort of de facto own this piece of code, right? All right. So. Yeah, just in closing, uh, this is uh, the same slide as I was showing earlier. It's just trying to wrap up by saying, yes, there is a certain relationship between ownership management and mining software repositories. Uh, the relationship is that we have a very broad view on software repositories, so that we also include all kinds of locking around development, not just locking in terms of uh, let's say how the version control was used and the relationship between MSR and ownership management continues insofar. Yes, we, we are interested uh, not so much in the generalizable uh, aggregated insights um, like numbers and distributions and correlations. We're more interested in actual day by day uh, predictions, right? But again, the underlying techniques in that we are extracting information from source code, repository, and that we use all kind of uh, data mining, information retrieval techniques. Those underlying techniques are very similar um, to MSR. All right.